In this video, we want to go ahead and take a little closer look at the region of convergence. We've done some examples with different types of discrete time signals, and we figured out what the Z-transform of these signals is and what their corresponding region of convergence is. But let's go ahead and back up and do a little bit more kind of general proof establishing how the region of convergence is related to the signal characteristics. In particular, how signals exist on the time axis, whether they extend infinitely far to the right or infinitely far to the left or infinitely far in both directions, how that dictates how the region of convergence is in the complex plane. Just as a reminder of the ROC, region of convergence, this is the portion of the Z plane or complex plane, however you'd like to say that, where X of Z exists or where it converges. So it's the set of points Z in the complex plane such that this quantity X of Z is a well-defined quantity. We know that X of Z can't contain any poles. Remember what a pole is. A pole of the Z transform X of Z is a part of the Z plane such that when I evaluate my Z transform, so if Z is a pole location, that means when I plug into the Z transform, I get infinity out. So we know that the region of convergence is never going to contain a pole because the pole when evaluated at the pole location causes my z transform to equal infinity or its magnitude to equal infinity so I know I'm never going to have any poles in this region of convergence and we've seen that kind of time and time again in the examples that we've worked. So as we work through this let's just start off first talking about finite duration signals. So let's first talk about finite length signals and then we'll in the last parts of this video we'll talk about more general signals that might extend infinitely long in either one or both directions. So since we're talking about finite duration signals, the signal that we're working with, x of k, this discrete time signal, we're going to go ahead and assume that it's non-zero on some kind of arbitrary interval on the discrete time time axis. So over the region of time k1 to k2, we're assuming that x of k is non-zero and outside of this, so for all k greater than k2 and all k less than k1, it is equal to zero. So this is just the only portion on the time axis where it's possibly non-zero. So in that case, our Z transform of this signal simplifies a little bit. Instead of having to sum from minus infinity up to infinity, we only have to sum over the potentially non-zero parts. So our lower limit can start at K1 and our upper limit can be K2 because outside of K2, X of K is zero and outside of k1, x of k is zero, so all we've done is exclude the zeros in this infinite summation. And what we've seen, and what we've said before, is that we know that this sum converges because we're only adding up a finite number of things. So as long as each term is finite, and by term I mean x of k times z to the minus k, I'll end up with a finite sum, because the finite addition of finite things is a finite quantity. So the only points that we know that we need to, to worry for about are when this quantity here is possibly infinite. Let's go ahead and assume that x of k is not infinite itself, that the signal itself is well behaved. So for what values of z might z to the minus k be infinite? So let's think about that. So first of all, if our signal has a k2 greater than zero, that means that it exists for positive values of time k, if I actually write out the definition of the Z transform, I'm going to end up with an X of Z that contains powers of Z raised to negative numbers. So the K equals one term, I'll have X of one times Z to the negative one. When K is equal to two, I have X of two times Z to the negative two, and so on. So if my signal exists for positive times, I'm going to have Z's raised to negative powers, I can think of z to the negative 1 as 1 over z, z to the negative 2 as 1 over z squared. So obviously, the region of convergence can't include z equals 0. So if I am ever in a situation where my finite length signal has positive times that it's non-zero, then z equals 0 needs to be excluded from the region of convergence. What if my signal x of k exists for negative time? So what if k1 is less than 0? Well, again, if we go back to our definition of the Z-transform, that means I might have a term for k equals negative 1, so I would have x at time negative 1 times z, and maybe x at time negative 2 times z squared, x at time minus 3 times z cubed, and so on. 
But if my signal x of k exists for negative time, I'm going to have z is raised to positive powers, which means that my region of convergence can't include z equals infinity, because then z is infinity, z squared is infinity, etc. So for finite duration signals, the only parts of the complex plane that I need to worry about are possibly z equals zero and possibly z equals infinity. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about infinite duration signals now. What we need is we need the magnitude of x of z to be less than infinity if z is part of the region of convergence. So what does it mean for the magnitude of z? So if we just write out the z transform, that's the sum from minus infinity to infinity, x of k times z to the minus k, and I took the magnitude of this. From this line to this line, I've actually used our triangle inequality. So instead of an equality here, I have less than or equals because we know that the magnitude of a sum is always less than or equal to a sum of magnitudes. So I've used that triangle inequality here. And then from this part here to this part here, all I've done is use the fact that a product of magnitude or a, a magnitude of a product is a product of magnitude. So I've just rewritten it like that. And then this infinite sum right here, I went ahead and split up into two pieces. There's this first part, which contains all the terms from minus infinity up to negative 1. And then there's this part right here, which includes all the terms from 0 to infinity. So I've just really taken this double-sided sum and split it up into two pieces. And then just to kind of uh, make things a little bit more compact, this is a, is a summation over all negative times. So I'm going to call that S sub minus, so it's just kind of collapsing this big sum into this notation right here. And then for k equals 0 to infinity, let's go ahead and define this sum as s sub positive. So it's kind of the positive sum and the negative sum. And what am I wanting? I'm wanting x of z, the magnitude of it, to be less than or equal to infinity. So if the magnitude of x of z is truly going to be less than or equal to infinity, then I need both of these to be finite. So I need s minus to be finite and I need s plus to be finite. So let's go ahead and figure out conditions on these to ensure that the individual portions s minus and s plus are indeed finite. So let's suppose that we can find some numbers. Okay, So here I've proposed numbers a plus a minus and r plus r minus. And I've chosen these numbers to satisfy these two lines of math right here. So basically what these two math lines of math say are that the first one has to deal with negative time and the other one has to deal with positive time. So let's look at the negative line, negative time line first. This says that I can find this number a minus and this number r minus such that the magnitude of x of k for negative times is always less than or equal to this signal. So in your head, kind of picture some arbitrary x of k and just pick a minus and r minus such that this inequality is always true no matter what k is at negative time. So suppose we can find these numbers and that's all it is. A, a minus is just a number, r minus is just a number. What that means is that we, by finding these a minus and r minus, we have found numbers that make sure that x of k grows no faster than r minus to the k for negative time. So we, we've bounded and kind of capped this signal for negative time. Same thing, same discussion for positive time. a plus and r plus are just numbers, and we've chosen a plus and r plus such that the magnitude of x of k is always less than a plus times r plus to the k. So if this is actually true, if we're actually able to find these numbers, that means that our discrete time signal x of k grows no faster than r plus to the k for all positive time. So if we can find these numbers, a plus, a minus, and r plus, and r minus, then these, this statement right here is true. I've been able to find these that guarantees x of k grows no faster than this amount for positive and no faster than this amount for negative time k. So how is that useful? Well, if we can actually, then this means that s minus of z converges for all z whose magnitude is less than r minus. And we can actually prove this now. This part's now pretty easy to prove. So recall what s minus was equal to. 
it was equal to this sum right here. It was equal to the sum from minus infinity to negative 1 of the magnitude x of k times the magnitude of z to the minus k. So this first line here is just simply the definition of s minus. From here to here, what have I done? Well, I've used the fact that we've assumed that we can find this number a minus and this number r minus such that a minus times r minus to the k is always bigger than x to the k. So that's why we have the inequality here. I've, I've used that fact to get, go to a larger number here on this second line because we've assumed we were able to find these two numbers. That's part of the assumption of this proof here. From this line to the third line, what have I done? Well, nothing has changed in terms of inequalities. I've just done a little bit of algebra. Right here, I have r minus to the k, magnitude of z to the minus k. Well, magnitude of z to the minus k, I can think of magnitude of z to the negative 1 to the k, which is really 1 over magnitude of z to the k. So that means I can write this like this. It's r minus over magnitude of z, just doing simple algebra. And then this summation right here, it's not in too different of a form that we normally look at, but typically when we work with these sums like this, we prefer to have numbers or the counter variable start at 0 or 1 and go to infinity, not start at minus infinity and go to a number. So what have I done from here to here? All I did was let n equal a negative k. So I did just a simple change of variables. Since n is negative k, that means when k is minus infinity, n is infinity. And when k is minus 1, that means n is 1. And that means that instead of a k here, I would have a negative n, which is the same thing as flipping this and having an n there. So just a slight re rearrangement of this geometric sum. And obviously this sum right here, we know converges as long as the magnitude of this thing raised to the n is less than 1. So that means I need to have magnitude of z divided by r minus, the magnitude of that, less than 1. Well, multiply both sides by r minus, and you end up with this inequality right here. So we know that s minus will always converge for magnitude of z less than this number r minus, assuming I can find a minus and r minus to begin with. So that gets half the proof. Let's do now essentially the exact same thing for the positive part. We can prove that s plus converges for all z's whose magnitude is greater than r plus. So how can we do that? Well, let's start by the definition of s plus. This is just the definition of s plus we had before. From this first line to the second line, I'm using the assumption that I can find this a plus and r plus that bound my discrete time signal x of k. So from line 1 to line 2, I've made it bigger because I'm replacing x of k with a plus times r plus to the k. I made it a bigger signal. That's why this sum got bigger. And then from here to here, the same type of algebra. Instead of r plus to the k, magnitude of z to the minus k, I can write that as r plus over magnitude of z to the k. I don't even need to do a change variable here. This is already written in a form that's very obvious that it converges as long as the magnitude of this quantity is less than 1. So I need r plus divided by magnitude z less than 1. If you multiply both sides by magnitude of z, I end up with r plus less than magnitude of z, which is this inequality right here. r plus is less than magnitude of z, or if you want to read it the other way, magnitude of z is greater than r plus. So this sum is going to converge for all magnitudes of z that are bigger than r plus. So now we can go ahead and summarize what we've proven very generally. We can also define these terms that we've been using, left-sided, right-sided, and two-sided. So a left-sided signal is simply a signal, a discrete time signal, that's zero for all positive time, including k equals zero. A right-sided signal is a discrete time signal that's equal to zero for all k less than zero. And a two-sided signal is one that basically goes infinitely in both directions. What we've proven on the previous charts is that any time I deal with a left-sided signal, its region of convergence is going to have the form magnitude of z less than r minus. So left-sided signals are always going to have a region of convergence that's inside some signal or some circle in the complex plane. 
Similarly, anytime I deal with a right-sided signal, its region of convergence is always going to have the form magnitude of z greater than r plus, because we did that on the previous charts. We fixed, we found an a plus and an r plus to bound x of k. And we can always, we can always find that. Just make a plus big enough and make r plus big enough. We can always find those numbers. And when we find those numbers, we proved that the region of convergence was this because we proved how s plus always converged. It always converged for magnitude of z greater than r plus. If you take both of these inequalities together, and we need both s minus and s plus to converge, it means that for two-sided signals, the region of convergence always has to have this form. The magnitude of z has to be less than r minus and greater than r plus. So this is what we've proven very generally for discrete time signals in terms of how the time domain properties of the signals and how they extend to the left or to the right impacts the region of convergence. For finite length signals, it was almost trivial. It is the whole z-plane except for possibly the origin or infinity. For infinitely long signals, we have slightly more complicated geometric structure. And this is what that structure is in terms of words. So pictures, it looks like this. When I'm dealing with a right-sided signal, something that is zero for all negative time and non-zero for positive time, the region of convergence is always outside the circle. So it's outside this r plus circle. A left-sided signal is zero for all positive time, including k equals zero, and it's non-zero over here. Its region of convergence is always going to be inside of some circle r minus. When dealing with a two-sided signal that's infinitely long in both the positive and negative time, then its region of convergence is always going to look something like this. It's going to look like an annulus or a disk. It's the points in the z-plane here shaded blue that are bigger than r plus and less than r minus. So we have now kind of rigorously defined how signal characteristics in the time domain impact what the region of convergence looks like for infinitely long signals. On the next chart, we'll actually go ahead and work through an example now where we're working with a two-sided signal and figure out what its region of convergence is for a very concrete example.